Welcome to the Game and Going Deeper podcast, a podcast series by the Gamers Brotherhood where we talk about everything personal development, mental health, and sexuality. Your hosts today are the terrific trio of Michael Callen and myself, Matt. Uh, today we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence. So we're going to be digging into all the juicy stuff around emotions. Um, we have four questions that we're going to be unpacking. The first one is, how would you describe your relationship to your emotions? In what ways do you avoid your emotions? What are certain situations that bring up a lot of emotions for you? And what is your greatest learning about emotions that you can share with the audience? So today is going to be a vulnerable episode, folks. We're going to be digging into some, some juicy things. Um, so we will be continuing uh, these discussions, obviously, the last Thursday of every month, which we do in the Gay Men's Brotherhood, where we have our Zoom hangouts, where you will be invited to come and share your experience. Um, this podcast and YouTube channel is listener and viewer supported. So if you are really enjoying what we're creating, you can support us by heading over to our Patreon page, where you can find the, the link in the show notes and contribute by su uh, supporting the show. Um, it helps us to continue making content for you and supporting our community. So we do thank you in advance for your generosity. <laughs> um, and just a, 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 a a call out we are uh, we've officially opened the game and going deeper membership doors um they are open now um if you've been waiting to join um in on more than just once a month of the zoom hangouts we offer them weekly in this space uh we do lots of personal development we do lots of community building um and and coaching right so um we have a lot of great programming planned for you guys in 2022 so come on over and join us by going to the game and going deeper.com so you can register today um, and in January, I will be taking uh, members through our Healing Your Shame course. It's a course that you can take on your own, but I'm going to be taking people through it over the course of a 12-week journey. So if you're wanting to heal your shame and move towards more of your authenticity, I would encourage you to join the membership so you can come on that journey with myself. Um, all right, so we're gonna, we, we always read um, a review. So we have one this week from Dane Duncan. Um, he says, where has this been all my life? I'm so distressed by the lack of dialogue and heteronormative media on the internet. I'm a clinical psychologist working with couples, but also personally, this is valuable. I love to tackle, I'd love to tackle some issues I've been dying to go deeper on relational boundaries, lone wolf, dating apps, and culture. Well, we have all of, we have an episode for each one of those, and I'm assuming you're referring to that. Um, and Dane, if you have not joined us, come and join us in the Game Men's Brotherhood, because your uh, clinical experience as a psychologist could be very much beneficial in our community. So come on over and join us. Okay, so let's hop in. Um, I want to just do a little bit of a recap because this month, um, this is the third episode of the Empowerment Series. So we've been talking about um, confidence. We did a episode on real versus fake confidence. Uh, we did one on dating apps. And now we're doing one on emotional intelligence. We see these as three primary things when it comes to feeling empowered as a gay man. So um, we are excited to be talking about this today. So the, the term emotional intelligence was actually introduced by um, Daniel Goleman. And he um, defines emotional intelligence as the ability to understand and manage your own emotions and those of the people around you. People with a high degree of emotional intelligence know what they are feeling, what their emotions mean, and how these emotions can affect other people. So he's identified five domains uh, when, it, when it comes to being emotionally intelligent. The uh, first one being self-awareness, second one being self-regulation, the third one being motivation, fourth one, empathy, and the last one, social skills. So today I've designed the question specifically to talk about self-awareness and self-regulation. We're not going to go too much into motivation, empathy, and social skills um, because it's just, we don't have enough time. <laughs> so it's a lot of stuff to, to go over. So, um, so to give people an idea around self-awareness, this is just basically having an understanding of your emotional world, who you are, um, how you are as an emotional person. And then self-regulation is going to be looking at how we manage our emotions, right? So we can become more emotionally intelligent. So let's start out by just kind of defining what are emotions, because some people might not understand what emotions are and might not have a lot of self-awareness around this. So um, according to Dawn and Sandra Hockenberry in the book, Discovering Psychology, 
An emotion is a complex psychological state that involves three distinct components. So a subjective experience, a physiological response, and a behavioral or an expressive response. Right. So for people who aren't very expressive and they just have a lot of emotions going on inside, it's like we have this perception of reality. It creates a physiological response. Our nervous system becomes activated and we have an emotion. Right. One of the most profound ways of, of working with emotions is learning to express them. So I think this is going to be something that we're going to be able to, to chat a bit more about today. Um, and then a couple things for me that I wanted to point out is what for me, what emotions are They're They're emotion. They're, they're messengers of need. Right, they're they're constantly communicating to us what we need as far as things that are going unmet in our lives or things that we want to move towards. So I, I look at emotions as like the compass to giving us direction of what how we can get our needs met and how we can feel fulfilled. Um, they do stimulate our nervous system. This is where they actually come through. They are in, they live in the body. They come through the nervous system, and we need to learn to work with our nervous systems if we want to get good at processing our emotions. Um, so looking at uh, different ways of, that people deal with emotions, we have, um, there's three categories. So we have overregulation, which is people who tend to avoid. It's an avoidance pattern with emotions. So it's, it can be distracting, numbing, um, repression, um, using any sort of addictive um, substance or behavior as a way to, to avoid or overregulate. And then we have people who tend to fall under the under-regulation category, which is people that get anxious, they get flooded by their emotion. So we want to learn how to practice self-regulation, right? When we're, when we're over, um, overly anxious about our emotional states. And then we have something uh, called healthy emotion processing, which is people who don't avoid or become anxious by their emotions. They, they tend to be pretty even keel and they're able to practice um, the, the art of allowance, right? Allowing our emotions to move through us and self-regulation, which is going to be learning self-soothing techniques. When our nervous system does become under-regulated or over-regulated, we can um, learn how to work with our nervous system. And I want to just, I want to point out that it is completely normal and natural to move through all of these, right? We don't just get great at emotions and we're, we're, we, we stay that way. Like things can happen in our lives where we become, we, we, we do need to move into under-regulation or over-regulation. Uh, there's no judgments. And I think it's just, that's part of the allowing and becoming emotionally intelligent is understanding that this is just part of being human, right? Emotions are messy. Um, and, you know, some, some research around emotions, um, and the nervous system is, um, they are energy. Emotions are energy that they, they, they excite in the nervous system. They're particles of energy. There's science around this. And uh, it takes about 90 seconds for an emotion to fully release if you allow it, right? And if you don't, it tends to go into, it stays stuck and, and trapped in your body. So this is why, in, in my personal opinion, I think a lot of diseases, uh, mental health, addiction, these sorts of things are unprocessed emotion that we haven't learned to work with yet. So that's why uh, I think this topic is so important. And I wanted to bring it forward. Um, just because I think there's so much value in learning how to be emotionally intelligent. So um, let's let's start with the first question. Um, how would you describe your relationship to your emotions? And I'm going to choose Mr. Callan. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I was like, <laughs> he's going to choose me first today. Um, I love this topic. First and foremost, mm -hmm. I just want to say that. And I loved your explanations at the beginning. Because um, I think that's really important for everybody to understand a lot of those things. So it was a really, really great intro. Mm -hmm. um, set everything up perfectly. Um, just a little background on me. I came from a history of, uh, being very avoidant. Like I locked things down, very avoidant from like a divorced family life. It was like, I remember not crying from kind of the moment my parents really separated when I was like five or six, like really young until I was like 16, there was like 10 mm -hmm. years where I just, I never cried at anything. Like it was like a fucking wall. Um, until it kind of like all cracked when my dad finally kicked me out when I was 16. So it was just like an explosion happened. And since then, I've gotten a lot better at regulating those emotions. Um, so my relationship with emotions is very uh, up and down. Um, 
when I was younger, it was like, they didn't exist. They were like under lock and key. It was like, those aren't there. Those aren't real because I had to keep it together for the mm-hmm. family. Cause everybody else in my family was a fucking hot mess. Like my, my family were like <laughs> over a functioning emotional people. Like they were all had thoughts and feelings and emotions and all sorts of things. And I was just like, I guess I have to keep it together for all y'all. Um, but as I got older and once I did start kind of crying, I remember developing a better relationship with my emotions, not by figuring out what was going on inside of me, but by allowing things like TV or movies or reading books now, especially Mm -hmm. to just allow me to connect to an emotion and feel the emotion that the character was feeling. And if it hit me emotionally, I let myself cry where, but like nobody else could be around. Like that still like was like a hard no, but I allowed myself to feel those emotions finally. And I didn't know where they were coming from, but I knew it had to do a lot with like all those lockdown emotions for years. They just needed to come up and they needed to process. So my relationship with emotions has gotten a lot better over the years by using that tactic of allowing um, like really great, like I love really great scripted TV, like just TV that just like, it, it's telling you a story and it's building the characters and your connection to the characters and the emotions. And like when they go through a powerful transformation or something powerful happens and you can feel that on like such a level for yourself and like the tears come, like let it rip. Like I'm now that person who I can, I can let it rip and I have no shame about that. Um, but the thing that probably does it for me the most is reading books, um, especially over the pandemic, like the past two years. I've, I mean, I've always been a big reader since I was 28. I kind of started, but reading books in the pandemic obviously had a lot more time. Um, but I also made a commitment to read LGBTQ plus uh, books, base books, so that I could actually like feel it on a different level. Because like, you know, heteronormative books are great and I love fantasy, but I didn't feel a connection like I did when I started reading like gay books. And so there's a couple series that I love and I read. And if y'all are interested, just message in the, in the group or something, whatever that I won't dive into it now. Um, But there's like this one series that it's just like, Oh God, it gets me right in the feels because it's two lead characters, gay men, and just like the emotions that they're going through and all the things. Like I remember in book four or five in book five something happens to a character and I just like I sobbed for like over an hour in bed like I should have been sleeping I was uh, like full on sobbing and then my roommate the next day is like oh are you okay like what was going on I was like this happened in my book he's like oh you're fucking kidding me right (laughs) but it's kind of been this door that allowed me to kind of walk through and experience those emotions and I now know through all the work that I've done that it kind of connects the dots as to like I don't know what the emotions are that are hiding in me or what stuff I need to process from my past I know it on intellectual level and I've done that work but on an emotional work level I know that I could like afford to cry a little bit more and to let things out. And so by reading and allowing myself to experience those emotions through those characters, I like I can let it rip. And it's like the most releasing, relieving thing. I call it like the Oprah ugly cry where you just like let it go. And then the next day you just feel so much lighter. Like we've all had that experience where you're just like, oh God, I feel so much lighter. So my relationship Mm -hmm. with my emotions has definitely grown over the years and it continues to get better. Um, So yeah, those are kind of the tools I use to activate or access my emotions, I guess you could say. What about Mm -hmm. you, Michael? Yeah, all right. Um, This is a great question and I love it because I knew exactly how I was gonna answer it, (laughs) even though it might seem juvenile, but for anyone who has seen the movie Inside Out, the relationship I have with my emotions is exactly the same. (laughs) That is how I like to visualize and imagine emotions within me. So, you know, and this is a very recent thing, Um, you know, before I used to, like many people, identify with them, get caught up with them, you know, like Matt was talking about in the beginning, either get flooded or avoid. I was more of an avoid kind of guy, still am to some extent. But now when I'm, when I'm caught up in my emotions, I, I like to imagine them all around like a dinner table. And there's me, real Michael, with all these little characters. And in the movie, Riley, um, the, the main character had the, the basic six emotions that, that people often refer to, which is um, anger, surprise, joy, 
discussed sadness and fear. And mine would be a little bit different if I had to pick six. There's more than six, of course. But if I had to pick six, I would say my favorites are um, excitement, calm, and joy. Those are three that I love. And but of course, we know that, you know, the emotional experience is not just a positive one. So we have to have some negative ones in there, too. And I have a very, very strong relationship with with my negative emotions, actually, more so than my positive ones. And that's only only recently because of the work I've done in actually bringing them to the surface and getting to know them. So the negative ones that I know very well would be fear, anxiety, and awkwardness. All of them I'm kind of experiencing right now as we do this podcast to some extent, <laughs> but I'm, I'm managing it, obviously. I'm here, I'm doing the thing. So yeah, my relationship with my emotions is, is one where I can identify them and not identify them as kind of separate or as temporary things that show up in certain circumstances, then they go away in other circumstances. And then I'll be triggered by something else in the external world. And then this other emotion will show up. So I like to imagine them as characters in my mind. And yes, I know that that movie Inside Out seems juvenile, but I definitely recommend everyone go watch it. It is a a masterclass in emotional intelligence. So on the topic of negative emotions, since I think that's where, oh my gosh, there's a big giant owl right in front of my building. Okay. It's huge. It's amazing. Um, Sorry. So the thing with negative emotions that I would say is that they are the ones that I avoided the most for most of my life up until very recently. However, as I've come to terms with learning how to process them, learning to invite them in, learning that they're, they're meant to be there, they're, they're part of the human experience, the goal is not to banish them. It has completely transformed the way I show up in, in my work, in my personal life, in, in everything. Because, you know, you realize that, that the goal is to, it, first of all, that they have a purpose. They have a purpose. They're there to tell you something. They're there to, Matt, you had said they're a messenger, right, of a need. Great way to say it. They're there to communicate with you and they're actually there for you, even though it is a a negative experience. Like, for example, my heart beats very fast when I'm nervous or when I'm scared. It might seem, you know, your body's saying this is a dangerous experience. But when you can regulate that and realize, okay, what's actually going on? What's the need that I need to have met? And then, you know, go about meeting that need. It completely transforms so, so much. So I'd say the first step in, in any have, in having any relationship with your emotions is naming it and identifying it and explaining it. I think that, you know, going back to self-awareness is such a hard thing. I want to challenge the listener out there to name as many emotions as you can. And I bet you can't get past 10. <laughs> it's usually like mad, sad, happy, whatever. There, there's not that many that we get to. But uh, researchers at Berkeley have identified actually 27 distinct emotions, uh, which to me, I was like, there's 27. I, you know, even I can't think much more than 15, but we have so many of them and we're, they're always up late. It's not like we just have one in one moment, right? Like, like I said, there's like this, I imagine this dinner table and they're all kind of there fighting for my attention, fighting for a piece. And I gotta be like, listen, everyone, <laughs> I hear you. We're all here. Here's what's going to happen. I kind of it is that regulation. It is, it's, I wouldn't say control because I don't believe I really can control it, but I can regulate it and, and impact my experience of it. Whereas I think before what I would do is get flooded, totally become at the whim of whatever I'm feeling anger and then do something stupid to say something stupid and just make my situation worse. So yeah, I think in terms of relationship with emotion, anyone out there, if you want to develop your relationship with your emotion, first start by naming it, identifying it, what does it feel like? Describe it. Where do you feel it in your body? Right. That's, that's mm-hmm. another key way to develop that relationship. And Matt, I don't think you answered the first question. So I want to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I've made it very public on here that I am highly sensitive. I'm empathic. And with that comes emotional reactivity, right? It's just, it comes with the territory. Um, and that's both emotions. That's both positive and negative. I feel things very, very deeply. Um, I remember being a child and I was, I grew up in a household where there was a lot of conflict. So I was always in fear. Fear was a very common thing that I felt as a kid. And, um, so it was very intense for me, just very, very intense. I remember feeling just so much. Um, and then there was some, some traumatic things that happened in my childhood. And I think at that point in my life, I just shut off. I completely shut off. I went into overregulation, um, and I actually developed codependency as a, as an overregulation, um, 
tactic because I made everybody else's emotions. Like I just focused on their emotions, their, their stuff. And I just completely um, abandoned my sense of self. And, um, and I, I lived that way from probably all the way till I was probably yikes. It's crazy to even think this, but probably till I was about 24, um, just completely shut off. And, um, and my this is I think this is why my spiritual path like from 24 till now what 30 I'm almost 37 has been so intense for me um everything's been so intense for me I've been I've suffered so much in the last 10 or 15 years because I had such a backlog of emotions when you overregulate those emotions emotions don't just evaporate right they stay stuck inside you and my healing journey has been about reconnection to myself um learning how to feel and I, I, the first, the first probably five years of my spiritual um, journey and, and developing a spiritual practice, I was completely spiritually bypassing, right? I would be, I, what I didn't know how to emotionally regulate. So I would wish my emotions away. I would do ceremonies or I would do plant medicines or I would hold crystals or I would, you know, chant or whatever the hell you do. And I would, I was trying to discharge emotion, but really emotion can't be discharged um, in any other way other than feeling, right? You have to feel the emotion. Um, so this has been a profound learning for me. Um, and most of my relationships have been complete train wrecks because of this, uh, because I didn't know how to re regulate my emotions growing up. Um, and this is a very, it's, it's, I say it's fairly new for me being like a strong emotion regulator, like within the last two or three years. Um, and I would say the, the, the biggest thing that helped me become good at reg regulating my emotions is um, is healing trauma because trauma really is just an accumulation of unprocessed emotional energy and uh, and when you have so much of it occupying your nervous system you actually can't regulate if you have a backlog of emotion because it just floods you right and you you're not your your prefrontal cortex cortex goes offline um, and it's very very difficult to regulate so now when something emotional happens, I, I don't really go above a five out of 10. Whereas before I was, I would constantly be hovering at a five out of 10. And then if something intense would happen in my life, I would go to like an eight or a nine or even a 10 out of 10. So it's like good luck regulating from that place, right? Like you basically are just in survival mode. So I would say my relationship to emotions now is, um, is so different, so different. Like I feel, um, I feel like I've, this has been probably the biggest thing that's helped me develop my, more of my authentic self is because that my, I now I'm actually using my compass, right? I'm actually listening to the messages of my emotions and they're guiding me, right? My emotions are constantly guiding me. So the more I feel, the more I, um, I connect to the parts of me that, well, A, need to be loved or B, need to be inspired or, or whatever, right? Like, I just feel like I have much more um, intelligence around who I am because of learning how to feel my emotions. So yeah, I would say that's probably the best answer. Um, I could go into talking more about the avoidance, but I think that's the next question. So I won't go into that too much now. So um, yeah, we can just keep the same order. So Callan, in what ways do you avoid your emotions? Uh, well, <laughs> as somebody who got really good at managing my emotions, like I've, I, I've never been an outburst person. Like I've never had, I cannot recall in my lifetime when I had an actual outburst outside of adolescence. Like mm -hmm. as an adult, I've never lost it. I've never had like the short fuse and exploded or like any of that mm -hmm. in any way, like, you know, whether it could be, be super good or bad. Um, and I think I avoid emotions and I know I avoid emotions because I'll think about it. I guess I'm a very methodical person. Like I will be thinking about my emotions and I'll see them and I'll feel them. And I'll be like, mm, yeah, we can't do that right now. <laughs> and like, I'll just be like, mm, not right now. We'll do that later or on the weekend or something like that. Um, because I'd like to kind of like get things done and I'm just kind of like a go getter. I'm like, okay, let's focus on this or do that or whatever. Um, I've gotten a lot better at that, but I kind of probably avoid emotions 
I guess, you know what? I think a lot of people avoid their emotions by watching TV and like numbing themselves and like going out and drinking and partying. Mm -hmm. And for me, I find that that actually heightens my emotions and allows me to access them more, especially how I said about the TV. It kind of is a doorway for me to like understand them more. Um, And by seeing them explored in other people, I can go, oh yeah, I can resonate with that. And so I let it bring those things up in me. And so for me, that's actually a way for me to access that. Um, whereas I know most people that would be their way to avoid it. Um, Mm. but yeah, I think for me, it's just when they come up sometimes I'm very good at like recognizing them be like, Oh shit, I'm getting pissed or, Oh, I'm getting like hyper or whatever. If it's good feelings, I never limit those. Like if I'm out with people and like having a happy go lucky time, like I never taper those out, but it's more of the, like the kind of quote unquote negative emotions that I'm like, uh, got to lock that down for right now. Um, And it's usually just because I don't like doing that in front of people, because for me, it comes down to safety. And it's like, it goes back to, I remember we did a top, your like your top five people, your inner circle um, podcast episode. If you've not listened to it, go back and listen to it. Um, But it's like, I kind of reserve those moments for people who deserve it and who I feel safe with, who I know are going to be able to hold me in that space. So if I am feeling super vulnerable and I need comfort or I need just a support in that um, emotion that I'm feeling. Um, And I actually had one of these recently um, that I've not really talked about. I don't think I've talked about it all on the podcast yet. Um, But my mom was diagnosed with cancer uh, really recently uh, as like last month. Um, and the moment I found out, I kind of went into like, a like I started like tunnel visioning and was like, oh no, I'm just going to shut this down. But then I knew I was like, no, I can't, I can't do that. I know what that's going to lead to. And that leads to me cutting myself off and like not processing and all that kind of stuff. So what I did instead was I texted Michael and I was like, can I come over later? <laughs> I was like, I just, I really need to be around like some people right now, like some good people. Um, and so I kind of like locked everything down until then. I did the things I had to do during the day and it was maybe a couple hours later and I went over to Michael's and Star and they were like, are you okay? And I was just like, absolutely not. <laughs> and like, I couldn't even say the words. And so when I first said the words, like I just, burst into tears and I just let it happen because Michael and Star are two people in my life as yourself as well Matt but you live far away but like are the type of people that have earned that right in my life and so for me it's not as much as trying to avoid the emotion now it's more keeping it kind of on the back burner until I can be in that safe space whether it's by myself or with people who are like I trust that then I can allow those emotions to come through and to be processed. Um, And if you're all wondering, my mom did have surgery. Um, It all went well. We're still waiting on kind of more tests and things to come back, but everything is looking very positive and good. So I'll just leave that there. Um, But I couldn't have done this like a month ago. Like I couldn't have talked about it openly without having it trigger me immensely. But because I've processed the emotion around it and like all the things, I can now talk about it. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is something that happened. Still a little sore, but it's not to the point where it's like going to take me over. So that's how I kind of avoid emotions these days. What about mm-hmm. you, Michael? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for thank you for sharing that. That that was a very powerful experience for, for myself as well. And I want to say that from my perspective, you know, showing showing that kind of vulnerability in, in what you did in coming over and, and having you know the the knowledge to say hey you know what I'm not going to do the usual thing I do and I'm going to do this scary thing instead I perceive that as nothing but courageous extremely courageous and very mm-hmm. strong and powerful so mm-hmm. I want to give you kudos for that and, and for anyone out there listening I think a lot of people are have this fear of thinking oh you know if I admit I'm using air quotes. If I admit that I'm scared or anxious, then that makes me look weak. It makes me look this. People are going to judge me, reject me. But I would, I would argue that most of the time, that's not the case. I think most of the time people see that as strength. So, yeah. Okay. Um, How do I avoid my emotions? Well, I do it the way Callan said. I, (laughs) uh, yeah, 
Uh, for me, my my favorite is like, let's just put this away, put this in a box, and let's go party. And let's go, let's go drink, let's go have all kinds of sex because that feels really good. Uh, or the other thing is this guy here in my my phone. I like to <laughs> just not want to deal with it. And just like, just, what's on Instagram? Let's go scroll. Let's go scroll Instagram. Let's go see who who's on Facebook, that kind of thing. So those are the two main ways. I would say, you know, these days in the last couple of years, the partying and sex has subsided. So it's more so the the iPhone. Like I notice even when I'm working, even if I say, okay, I have to do this, I have to do this, this piece of content. As soon as I go sit down and I'm like, oh, but first I'm just going to check my phone, <laughs> which tells me, okay, Michael, What's going on here? Why, why do you not want to get this done? Why are you avoiding the work? What are you afraid of? For, you know, and, and then I kind of do my own self-work there. So I would say historically, definitely been a lot of uh, pleasure seeking. So and again, there, there's nothing wrong with drinking or partying or sex. That's not the issue. I, I want to make it clear. What I'm saying is when you're using these things as a means of avoiding and numbing your pain, it's just, I'm going to save you all some time. It's not going to work because it doesn't make the pain go away or it doesn't make the negative emotion go away, whatever, whatever is your feeling, right? We're all, we're all running from something, loneliness, suffering, anxiety, stress, whatever. It doesn't make it go away. It in fact prolongs it because you're just not dealing with it. You're putting it in the closet and it's just staying there growing, getting stinkier and stinkier, having more of a shitty impact on your life, creating results that you don't even want and you don't know why it's happening. So allowing it to be there, sitting with it, and everyone's like, I don't want to, no, no, no. I don't want to, I don't want to sit with anxiety. That sounds terrible. I don't want to sit with my stress. I don't, I don't want to sit with grief, right? These are things that we don't want to sit with, but I think Matt, you had said 90 seconds, you know, sometimes it's just as quick as 90 seconds and that can start, it's not going to go away, but it can start to find that you could find that relief through allowing, not necessarily just through like popping on your grinder and seeing who's online. Right. Mm -hmm. And we think that's the case. And I've done it, but again, it just prolongs it. The next day, or no, no, the next day, the guy walks out your door and guess what you're still left with? A giant pile of negative emotions that you have to deal with. So, you know, those are, I think, my, my, my favorite coping mechanisms. And while they can help with coping, like it does provide a sense of temporary relief. I want to underline, highlight the word temporary. Sure, you could have a glass of wine after a hard day at work and just kind of <clears throat> ease the pain a bit. But that is not a solution. That is a very short-term coping, coping mechanism, not, not the solution. So the solution, of course, is to allow it, process it. Sometimes that means talking to somebody about it, you know, like when, with Callan's example, you know, sometimes you need the connection, you need support. If you have that, loved ones, family, friends, even professionals can help you through this so that you're not numbing, you're not over drinking, overeating, overworking. That's another one, overworking, mm -hmm. uh, over gaming over shopping like there's no shortage of ways <laughs> we can numb our emotions so mm -hmm. those are my favorite sex partying <laughs> and then my iphone what about you know it's, yeah mine mine have kind of shifted over the years i think um i i learned from a young age i think i started using drugs and smoking cigarettes when i was 11 and now that now looking back like in retrospect i'm like it makes sense, right? Like I needed some way to, to numb out because I was feeling so, so intensely. Um, and then I, I, I started progressively getting worse and worse and like dabbling with harder drugs. And by the time I was 17, I was um, using crack and uh, I pretty much used like from 17 to 20, I was using like weekly. And then from 20 to 24, while I was in school, for, for learning how to become an addictions counselor, I would once every three months or something, I would go on a hardcore binge. So I didn't fully sober up. And this, is, this isn't this is super public. This is, I'm, I'm kind of exposing myself here, but hey, you gotta be authentic. Um, Till I was about 24. That's when that was, that was the last time that I remember using crack. And, um, and then throughout my twenties, I would say I was sexually compulsive and I was watching a lot of porn and having a lot of sex. Um, and then I started moving through a lot of spiritual work and doing a lot of deep, deep work. And, um, I was able to kind of shed those, but then, um, where I find myself currently is I still do overregulate, um, at times when things get intense, 
Um, but I do it consciously. I consciously overregulate. I don't, I don't just go on autopilot. I say, okay, things are feeling too intense right now. I don't have the bandwidth to be with this stuff right now. So I'm going to consciously choose to move towards uh, two things that I really enjoy. And one is food. <laughs> I love food. Um, and um, my phone. My phone is bad. It's bad, guys. Like I'm on my phone way too much. And to the point, like I'm very sensitive to electronics as well. So I have to really be mindful of how much I'm on them. And um, I do get overstimulated constantly. My nervous system gets overstimulated constantly because I'm on my phone too much. Um, so I'm really learning how to have balance around that. And there's two, there's two questions I'm asking myself. So when I'm finding myself emotionally eating, I will ask myself, Matt, what are you actually hungry for? Like, what are you, what are you looking for? And usually it's connection, believe it or not. I'm, I'm feeling disconnected um, from people and I'm, I'm wanting connection or I'm feeling disconnected from myself and I need to go within. And then the same thing with uh, my phone, like it's just scrolling, constantly scrolling. And I have to stop and pause and be like, what am I actually looking for? <laughs> right? Like, and it's connection, like usually. And that's why I say like, you know, if you look at addiction, I really don't believe that the cure to addiction is abstinence or sobriety. I think it's connection it's because when people who are struggling so much and they're so disconnected from themselves, the, the remedy is usually connection to self and other. And then you find that the addiction starts to dissipate. Um, so, yeah, I've, but I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm learning. I do, I, I do feel like a newbie with emotions still like I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's quite new. So I give myself a lot of grace and say, you know what? Hey, I can't, I can't be with this right now. So I'm not going to shame myself. I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm just going to put this over here for a bit and go and eat for a bit. And then I'll come back to it when I feel like my nervous system is able to, to bring it back online. So. Nice. I actually yeah. have something I want to say about that, Matt, because you brought yeah. up this point about um, <clears throat> addiction and how you think it's like being social and like connection that that is cure. And I fully, yeah. fully believe that as well, because yeah. I think there was, I have no idea where this actually came from. So don't quote me, but they did a scientific study with either mice or rats and they put drugs in, whether it was like crack or whatever in the water. Yeah. And yeah. the mice that they left alone would like drink themselves to death. Like they would go at it like until they killed themselves. Yeah. But the ones that were put in an area where there was other either mice or rats and that they had a lot of toys and a lot of things to do together, they mm -hmm. would go and use it, but then they would go and have fun. They wouldn't like they wouldn't <laughs> kill themselves with it. So I like and that, I think it was a social experiment they were doing because of like, you know, if being social and having that connection could help. And I, so, yes, I fully, fully agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and it kind of makes me think of um, Gabor Mate's documentary called The Wisdom of Trauma. And he goes to, down into East Hastings in Vancouver. And a lot of the people in that documentary are describing attachment trauma, right? They all have attachment trauma. What does attachment trauma lead to? Disconnection from self and other, right? So I do think when we heal attachment trauma, we learn how to connect again. And then we get all the things that we're looking for outside of ourselves. We start to learn how to meet those. And so, yeah, I fully um yeah that, that was a really profound study that was done okay um what are certain situations that bring up a lot of emotions for you Callan? ah uh, joy i love joy like when i know it's still pandemic life we we're supposed to go back to um dodgeball but they canceled that they postponed it just because everything that's going on um but i won't dwell on that but i love being social with people like that and even though I'm awful at dodgeball, it brings up such joy to me. Um, so like just being social and doing that kind of stuff just brings up like, uh, like exactly what we were just talking about, just being with other people and like having fun and whether that's having some drinks or going out for food or just watching a movie together or doing whatever, just being connected and social with like good people, with people who have like who really add value to my life. And I know that I add value to their life. And like, we have really balanced, great relationships. Like that just brings up all the great, lovely emotions in me. Um, and like, I can find myself in dodgeball. And I know it sounds silly, but like just experiencing like the most crazy amount of happiness and joy, even though nobody's watching or nobody's doing anything. I'm just like, I'm around other people. I'm feeling connected. I'm feeling part of a team. I'm feeling part of like a group energy 
and it's gay dodgeball as well. So everybody in there, like everybody's their own, you know, flavor of the rainbow in there. You have the super guys who are like super athletic and they want to win. And then the other guys who are like myself, who's awful. And like, I just enjoy playing and stuff. And I've caught myself in moments being like, this is just so great. Like, I just freaking love this. Like, it just makes me so fucking happy. Um, <laughs> so that definitely brings up a lot of emotions um, on the joyous side of things. And then on the negative side of things, what brings up a lot? Um, for me, I I know that the thing that triggers me the most, that I get the most like uh, about is injustice. Like when I feel like a like genuine injustice and I see it in front of my face, like I know that there's injustices around the world, like, you know, poverty and uh, Black Lives Matters. And there's a lot of like these types of injustices and yes, they need to be talked about and like upset and you need to do things but those are very prolonged, but I'm talking like the injustices, like in the moment when I can see somebody doing something or saying something in front of my face or something's happening, like right in front of me and I can hear it. I'm like, huh, huh, like, how are you saying this right now? Like, this is insane. Um, that really, really pisses me off. And I will like rip somebody's head off if I know that they are in the wrong and I'm in the right. And they're just pretending like they're the, like, they, their shit don't stink I'll be like oh, I will go to town um so that's probably the thing that triggers me the most is like injustice gets me going what about you Michael Ooh, good one I love I love this conversation I think we should have another one I know we talked about we only have so much time but maybe we can think about doing another one because I have so much to say okay the in terms of the triggering aspect I thought of two, I thought of two examples. One's very specific and very new, as in like the last 12 months. And that is anytime, this is gonna seem a bit random how specific it is, but anytime they show like those videos of like trees getting cut down or like rainforest being like wiped away, I feel pain and hurt all over my body as if I am the tree being lopped away. And it's very strange how, how visceral it is. And that is very triggering for me. And I don't know where it comes from, why that is, but mm -hmm. anytime I see those kinds of images on the news, or even if I'm walking down the street and they're like taking down like a giant oak tree, like I, I'm like, I want to run like, what the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> like, this is a tree. Mm -hmm. So I know it's very specific, but that one randomly has come up. And, and every time I see it, it does, it, it's almost like traumatizing for me to see that happen. And I, I don't know why. However, more generally, I would say anytime I get very triggered, anytime my, my value of freedom or authenticity gets, I perceive that it's getting trampled on. So people telling me what to do, don't tell me what to fucking do. <laughs> it's just not going to work out for you. <laughs> um, or anytime I feel like I have an obligation, like, oh, you have to go to this, like those kinds of things, like, I just get so triggered by that because again, it goes to, to my, my values of freedom and authenticity. Um, those are, I would say, the, the two that get me the most triggered in terms of the, the negative sense. With respect to feel-good emotions, so joy, excitement, all that good stuff that I love, satisfaction. I would say, you know, I have to kind of, I, I can very easily think back to times where I have had those emotions and feel the same intensity of it. If I just kind of close my eyes and bring myself there, the emotion comes back. Um, very intensely. And for me, I would say there's a handful of situations where I've been traveling. They've all been somewhere I've been traveling and I've been in nature. And that's the, the common theme. And oddly enough, it's been alone. So I'm by myself um, somewhere foreign, well, far away in like, I don't know, a jungle, a desert, you take your pick, a beach. And I just feel very joyous, happy, like just pure satisfaction, like nothing there's nothing wrong with the world <laughs> it's just this pure light and love kind of energy um of course i've had that same kind of emotion with with people as well in lots of different circumstances but those those ones i would say are the ones that come to me most quickly and most easily um and probably the, the two extremes of, of the end in terms of positive and negative there's of course lots lots in between yeah good question i'm dying to hear what matt has to say mm. 
Yeah, you guys made me think of a lot of things. It's interesting because it's so inter interesting to, to kind of monitor like how I'm defaulting and I'm defaulting to think of emotions as bad. Like, it's like, I'm like, I forget that, oh yeah, you can feel joy and like all these other things. It's like, <laughs> I'm, used, I'm so used to like, you know, trying to get away from these big, like dark, scary emotions because I think I've felt like that so much of my life. But, um, and I wrote down three things and they're all related to things I'm, you know, like the of, of bad emotions. So I'm going to try and add one in there that's good. But so the, the first thing that creates the most intensity for me as far as emotions would be relationships like bar none, like um, intimate relationships. Like I said, pretty much all my relationships, except for my last one, because um, I did a lot of growth in that relationship, but I have shown up in like ways that I'm totally not proud of. I, um, and again, it's attachment trauma. It just took over me, right? And then I get fear, like I get scared of abandonment or betrayal, or um, I can't trust easily, like that sort of energy comes up. And, but, it, you know, so fear is the predominant emotion, but then do, a lot of the work I've been doing on myself, I'm realizing that sure fear is there, but it's not the bottom emotion. The bottom emotion is shame, right? Because if I feel worthy, it doesn't matter if somebody betrays my trust or any of these things. It's because I'm putting too much of my emphasis on other, on them. So like shame is, is you know, my healing, my shame has really helped me to be more comfortable in my relationships because I feel worthy of attracting good quality men that are going to treat me well. Whereas before I would kind of just settle for guys that didn't really have their shit together and, and blah, 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 blah. So, um, second thing would be lying. I fucking hate when people lie to me and I'm, because I'm highly empathic, I can feel when people are lying and you know, it's just, it just creates anger for me. And then if I were to peel it back, because anger is a secondary emotion, I would say it's hurt. I feel hurt when people lie to me because um, it just, it feels like they don't respect me. Do you know what I mean? And that they don't respect me enough to give me the truth. Um, so that would be one. And then the other one for me would be performing. Um, it causes me anxiety. Like whenever I have to perform or put myself like under, under when I'm under the microscope, it just causes me anxiety and I get all like jittery and, and, and anxious. Um, okay. And then I'm going to play the other side of the coin for joy because I love relationships. I love sex. I love relating. I love deep conversations. I love all the goodness of, of what relationships offer. And I'm very relationship oriented. Like everything in my life is built around relationships and um, I love relationships. So I just think that even though I, I fear them and they do, call, they do cause me to sit with all my stuff, when you really are in alignment with somebody, there's nothing better. Like authentic relationships are really what I live for. They, they cause me to feel a lot of joy, contentment, peace, love, tranquility, harmony, like all the good emotions come through whenever I'm in, in a good relationship. So, yeah. All right, we're, we got one more question. Um, so... What is your greatest learning about emotions that you can share with the audience, Callan? Ooh, okay. Um, my greatest learning is that you have to do them. Like you, you can't run away from them. You have to do them. Um, I take it from me. I literally tried for so long. Um, so you, they're not going to go away. They're going to show up in your life in painful ways. Um, and when I say that, I mean like you know what you're saying disease anxiety stress like all these things they know like scientifically proven no stress adds to so many different diseases and problems that we have um you know like anyways so yeah you gotta feel them and i have like the quote you gotta feel it to heal it uh i love that that's one of my favorite ones um and then another thing i would say is if it's all new and it's all still very foreign to you is figure out your safe space for me mine is in my bed when nobody else is home and I can have free reign so whether that's me reading a book that I know is going to trigger me and start crying and then I can allow myself to kind of let it rip and just feel into those emotions and just like not care how long it's going to last but like I'm talking like the full-on sobbing like your body is shaking kind of crying and you don't need to know why but just go with it um and or the opposite, you know, like Matt, you introduced me to what is it, primal, prim, primal oh, yeah. rage, primal screaming, <laughs> primal screaming whatever. Yeah. Because for me, allowing myself to physically and emotionally express anger in a confined, safe space was for like I had locked that far away because 
as a younger person, I did not like the times that I let myself go there. And so allowing myself to do that. And again, finding the safe space for, for me, I don't do it when my roommate's home. Cause he'd be like, what the fuck? Um, but you know, when he goes out or when he's away or whatever, and if I have any kind of lingering stuff going on, I just feel like there's just like a lingering leftover of like, ah, or like frustration or whatever. I let myself just go and like scream into my pillows and just like punch them and kind of go crazy for a little while. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes it'll activate something, and it'll go like even more intense. And sometimes it'll be like, that's just it. I just needed to get that little like boop out. Um, but yeah, finding your safe space and allow yourself to kind of do those stupid things that you're like, this is fucking stupid, but just do it. Because nobody else needs to know you're doing it. You're the only person who knows you're doing it if you're doing it in that safe space, and you're by yourself or whatever. Um, so yeah, but you got to feel it to heal it. So that's my two cents. What about you, Michael? I love it. I don't know if I've heard you say that before, Callan. Feel it to heal it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Have to. Okay. I have two. I'm going to just use them both because I can't decide between them. So the first one is the benefit of negative emotions. Uh, the goal is not to be happy all the time. The goal is not to be only in the positive side all the time. That's not the goal. <laughs> that's not fun. It's going to be a very boring life. And you're, you're, it's, the world gives us enough situations that it's just not going to happen. You're just not going to be happy all the time. Sorry. So... I think one of the greatest lessons that I've learned and that I would want to share is that there is benefit to the negative emotion. So it's not something we even need to run away from. It's not something we even need to hide, avoid, resist, or numb from. There is benefit there for you. And, you know, I'd, I'd say you, you want the full experience of life. In order to have the happiness, you have to have the sorrow. One cannot exist without the other. You know, I, I love serenity. It's one of my favorite, like calm, tranquility, satisfaction, but I need to have anxiety, stress, and chaos so that that serenity is so much sweeter. So it's all part of it. It's all, it's all part of the process. So we're not running away from the negative. They're some of our best teachers, at least it's been my experience. My fear, my shame has brought me to where I am today. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for anything. So that's one. And the other one is, is, as I was just saying it in the last segment about how I can close my eyes and create any emotion. I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for the fact that we do influence our emotions. It's, it's not something that just kind of happens willy nilly to us. We can generate emotions if we want to. We don't always want to, but you can, right? So this is part of that regulation. It's part of that self-awareness. I think highly emotionally intelligent people know how to generate that emotion, know how to kind of take themselves from one end of the spectrum more to neutral or wherever they want to be. And as coaches or anyone will know this, we see a lot, you know, once I lose the 20 pounds, I'll be more confident. Once I have the boyfriend, I'll be happy. Once I have more money, you know, or, or my favorite one is, oh, once I'm on the beach and it's summertime, then I'll be able to relax. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. You could be happy. You could be confident. You can relax. None of those things need to happen. There are ways that we can create these this emotional feelings within us in a way that is still authentic to who we are. So yes, you know, it's, it's December now in Canada, so I'm not going to be lying on a beach, but I can still find ways to generate the feeling of relaxation within me in my current set of circumstances. So I think that is talking about empowerment. The theme of the month is empowerment. That for me is probably the most empowering thing I've learned about emotions is that, Hey, wait a minute. I don't need someone out there or the world out there to, to tell me how to feel. I can choose how I'm going to feel. And again, that doesn't mean you always want to feel good. Sometimes you want to feel angry. You want to feel sad and that's okay. So those are my two. Mm. Matt, what about you? Oh, you guys got some good stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of just really add to it because I think that you guys said a lot of good, stink, good things. Um, I, I, I feel like a broken record because I keep saying this in all the podcasts, but embodiment, but I'm going to frame it differently this time. I'll phrase it differently so people that can understand it differently. I would say meet your body with presence every day. Try and meet your body with presence. Get into the, the, the physiology of the emotions because I think so many of us, you know, people who, are, who are, are emotionally dysregulated are typically people who have trauma. Okay, if you haven't experienced trauma and your nervous system isn't all, you know, or you don't have a backlog of emotions, you're not going to struggle with this. It becomes a struggle because we have unprocessed stuff from our past. So I think that it's really important um, to 
to meet that stuff, to be with it. And we can only be with it through presence, right? And I think what ends up happening, you know, it, it's, I said that it takes 90 seconds for emo an emotion to process. That, the research shows that it's 90 seconds for it to release out of the nervous system, right? Not for not 90 seconds for you to stop ruminating about it, right? Rumination, mental energy and, and physiolog physiological are completely different. And I think that when we do our healing work, you know, I teach, I teach a concept called the emotional onion. And it's basically, um, we, we start with, with nothing. And then all of a sudden we have all these experiences, traumas, unprocessed emotions, things we didn't want to deal with. And they just kind of layer on over the years. And some people have larger onions than others. And, and, but when we go on our healing journey, we have to peel off the layers again. And usually how that shows up is it shows up through the same way that it went on. Right. And I think people get confused by the, by this idea of reliving versus releasing. And I, and when we are working with our emotional onion, we're just releasing, right? So we just have to kind of be like, okay, yeah, I felt that it was heavy. Now it's gone. A layer is gone off of this emotional onion. And I think, um, for people that really struggle to meet themselves with presence, I love what you're talking about, Callan, because I also do that. I call it like indirect access points to our emotions. So we're not, because some of us can't just sit with our emotions. It's way too fucking intense. So we need to do it, whether it's vicariously, we need to do it through um, some form of art or listening to music or something. And these are still, this is still very potent and an effective way to discharge emotion. Um, so when, when we do meet our, our body with presence, we are developing the skill of, um, of the opposite of dissociation, right? Where we're being in our body so we can release, right? And Callan, you talk about feeling to heal. That's what it's about. We have to be embodied and we have to be present in order to feel. And what people tend to do is they intellectualize their emotion and they, they think about their emotions and then it just causes rumination. And the thing about rumination is it does not discharge the emotion. It stays stuck in a hamster wheel. So you just constantly ruminate, ruminate, ruminate. And then you eventually ruminate enough until you can become embodied and cry or something. So rumination is, is, is also a tactic that's used by the, by the body, well, the mind and the body working together to try and help you get to that place where you get so activated, where you can't help but to cry, right? But there's a different way that doesn't lead to so much suffering which is to just go directly to your body. Like don't let the mind have to eat off of all this onion to cause more rumination. So again, presence and embodiment, these sorts of things are going to be the fast track towards more emotional intelligence. <sighs> yeah, great episode guys. This was really, uh, really good to hear. Do you, is there anything you wanna add before we wrap up? For me, no. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you to the listener and viewer for chiming into yet another episode. I don't even know what episode are we at right now. Do you know? 62, three. That's impressive. Yeah. Like that. yeah That's impressive. Like that. yeah. We've talked, we've pumped out a lot of good stuff. So um, for people that are new to um, this, that maybe this is the first episode you're hearing of ours. Uh, we do have um, a, a Facebook group um, called the Gaiman's Brotherhood. We would love for you to come and join us. There's, we got about 4,500 guys in there who are all on this journey of personal development and transformation and spirituality. And uh, we're, we're creating more quality in the gay community. That's, that's, that's our mission over there. So uh, come and join us. If you are uh, listening to us on your favorite uh, podcast platform, you can subscribe and please leave us a review. We do read those reviews uh, over uh, the, the episodes here. And if you're watching on YouTube, please, um, Subscribe to our channel, hit the bell icon so you'll get notified when we release content each week and uh, leave us comments because we do respond to the comments and we do love to hear from our community. So much love to you all. Have a beautiful day. Bye.